Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Justin Tozzi. He is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Texas Tech University. He works in social, political, legal, and moral philosophy, and especially on state legitimacy, special obligations, and social morality. He is the author, together with Brandon Warmke, of a recent book, Grandstanding the Use and Abuse of Moral Talk, and that is going to be the focus of our conversation today. So, Dr. Tozzi, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Oh, absolutely, Ricardo. Thanks so much for, for having me on. Okay, great. So, I mean, what you focus on in the book is moral grandstanding. So let's start with that. First of all, what is moral grandstanding? How do you define it? So just the quick and dirty definition, um, if you, you want just like a, a slogan, uh, is that moral grandstanding is the use of moral talk for self-promotion. So these are the people that you see on your social media feed, just normal people who sound like they're writing politicians' press releases or, you know, a corporate press release or something like that. Um, but the product is, is them uh, and they're selling themselves using morality. So to give a, a more technical philosophical definition, you might want to start, you know, by thinking, well, of course, you have to say something about morality. So a lot of people want to stop there uh, to, to define grandstanding. They'll say it's just some of this talk about morality and it has a certain character that I don't like or something like that. Often then when, when people like to, to go this way, uh, they want to stop with, you know, um, these jerks that I disagree with or, uh, you know, in insincere people or, or something like that. We think that uh, that's a mistake. Um, so you can grandstand and say something true. Uh, you can grandstand and really mean everything that you say. And actually some of the things that, that we'll talk about that are, are so bad about grandstanding are so bad because people are sincere uh, when they do it. So the other element that, that we think um, you have to have uh, in order for some moral, moral expression or utterance to count as grandstanding uh, is that it has to be motivated in the right way. Uh, so. You have to uh, say what you say because you want people to think well of you uh, because of your moral qualities. Uh, you want people to, to recognize that you are morally respectable or maybe even really morally impressive. Um, and uh, you, you try to, to achieve this, this goal uh, by uh, showing people that you have you know, really impressive values, you're really morally sensitive, uh, or something like that. So when you do, uh, when you engage in moral talk uh, in that way, you're grandstanding. Mm -hmm. I understand. By the way, I didn't have this question on my list, but are there different types of grandstanding? Because we are talking about moral grandstanding. But for example, in the book, you also talk a lot about political grandstanding. I mean, perhaps the, I mean, trying to differentiate politics from morality it is a bit tricky, but uh, I mean, are there different types of grandstanding? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, pick an arena of life, um, anywhere where, where there are uh, qualities people can, can have that are impressive and they might delude themselves into thinking that they have to some impressive degree, people will uh, manage their, their reputation uh, along those lines. So there's religious grandstanding, there's intellectual grandstanding. Um, the term, you know, actually initially comes from uh, a book in the 19th century about baseball. Uh, so there's something that, that people called the grandstand player who would, you know, take an unnecessary, like slow or, or circuitous route to the ball and, you know, dive and roll all over the field, basically playing to the cheap seats, um, grandstanding. Uh, so that's, that's where the, the expression comes from as, as far as we know. Um, so yeah, not, it's not limited to the moral domain. Um, and, and yeah, right. There can be political grandstanding too. Um, yeah, we'll get into the political side of things later. Uh, before that, uh, people recently have been using, particularly in intellectual circles, I guess, the term virtue signaling a lot. So uh, is virtue signaling, signaling the same as moral grandstanding? Are there differences and what are them? Yeah, um, great question. Um, 
So let, let me say like the, I mean, there are a lot of little differences. Um, let me say the main thing uh, is that signaling is just a much broader category uh, of, of phenomena than what we're talking about. Uh, so as the term signaling is used in psychology and in, in biology uh, in other social sciences, uh, it is anything that's a display that sends information uh, to, to other people or, or other creatures or, or whatever. So you know, people talk about the color of frogs uh, as, as signaling or, you know, the, the peacock's tail as, as signaling. Um, so it's just, any, you know, anything that's observable uh, that communicates somehow, right? So, you know, the frog color sometimes signals that it's poisonous. Uh, the peacock is, you know, it's a signal of fitness that so they can lug around this, this long and impressive, beautiful tail uh, and so on. So these things are, are signaling. Um, so, you can see maybe where where this is going wrong uh, when we apply this to moral behavior or moral speech. Um, just being seen doing the right thing uh, or anything that you know can be interpreted in, uh, through a moral lens would be a, a kind of signaling. Uh, but that's not really what what we're objecting to when we talk about grandstanding. And usually, I think. When people talk about virtue signaling, they're not complaining just about like, oh my God, how embarrassing! I can see what this guy's you know moral views are. Um, you know, he must he did that because he wanted to do the right thing. That's ridiculous. Of course, no one no one really thinks uh, that, that that's a bad thing. Um, so this is why we say it's so important to recognize that grandstanding has to have this motivational component. Uh, so this is the thing that I, I think a lot of people who talk about virtue signaling are, are missing. Um, so they would count it as virtue signaling, basically just being seen behaving well, right? Or or making any ordinary moral speech. Um, but you know that's not that's not the problem, right? The problem is uh, people doing this in a showy way because they want to impress other people, uh, and that's the main reason that we prefer the term. Grandstanding. We think, you know, a lot of people would be a lot less confused uh, if they used this term uh, instead. Uh, you know, other things are, you know, things like sincerity is one thing. So a lot of times people think that, um, you know, uh, if uh, moral talk is insincere, then it's just, you know, it's just virtue signaling or something like that. And then you, you know, get into fights about whether people really meant it, and it's a big waste of time. Uh, it's also it's politically charged. Uh, so we have social science evidence showing that grandstanding, you know, people uh, report grandstanding motivations regardless of their political ideology. So it, does, it tells you nothing uh, about whether someone's likely to grandstand uh, based on just knowing they're liberal or conservative. Um, however, uh, people uh, people who are, are more extreme uh, in their ideology are, are more likely uh, to engage in grandstanding. Um, is there anything else? I, I think that that's enough differences between grandstanding and virtue signaling. Just use our term; it's it's much better. Uh. Yeah, it, it, when you want for it to have a negative connotation, because as you were saying, virtue signaling is not necessarily bad, right? Right. Yeah. Um, and and you know we can I mean we can talk about this uh, at some point. Grandstanding is also not necessarily the wrong thing to do. We think it is always like bad at least a little bit um just like lying is always bad at least at least a little bit in some sense um but you know that, that's just a, a complication about how morality works but i mean it's even stronger in the case of virtue signaling because sometimes it's like there is no problem at all um and and you know people uh sort of throwing this around as as an insult uh tends to obscure the uh the way uh the way moral communication works and what, what it has to do with uh, with how morality works. Yeah. So is this phenomenon of moral grandstanding something new, something recent, as it always existed? Because, I mean, since nowadays we are exposed a lot to people on the internet, social media and so on, perhaps due to our availability heuristic or something like that, we tend to think that things or social phenomena that we observe more extensively, let's say nowadays, are new from an historical perspective. But is that really the case with moral grandstanding? 
Uh, no, I, I think. Um, I mean, pretty clearly, pretty clearly not. Um, but but I do think it's reasonable for people to think that uh, they see a lot more of this behavior th than they once did. So let me back up a little bit and, and tell you why I think it's it's definitely not new. Uh, and the reason I think it's definitely not new is that we're basically hardwired to behave this way. Uh, we are all self enhancers. So if there's some like positive, vague trait uh, that that we can evaluate our, ourselves in terms of, people tend to think uh, they are pretty good in terms of that trait. We we all think we're we're like above average in kindness, you know, more forgiving than other people, uh, more friendly, um, and more moral, uh, and and perhaps. Uh, more, uh, the effect is probably stronger uh, when it comes to morality th than any uh, of these these other traits. Everyone wants to think that they are morally above average, maybe even morally great. Uh, no one wants to think, you know, I, I'm kind of a dirt bag. Uh, well, most of us don't want to think that. Uh, so, uh, so there's that. Uh, we are also uh, impression managers. Uh, so we want other people to share these positive uh, thoughts uh, about us. We, you know, we want everyone to know. Uh, that we're we're morally pretty good, um, and probably better than you know most other people they know, uh, and and so on. Um, people will go to great lengths to protect their reputations and so engage in in impression management. So there's one study uh, where, where uh, I don't know how they they got to do this. Um, I would have thought an IRB would would shut this down, but they made people take this doctored uh, implicit association test. Uh, giving them some implicit bias score and, and, you know, so it was set up so that it would give them a very negative score. And then they told the people, uh, well, okay, so we're, we're going to publish these results and, you know, people will see what your score is. Uh, but, you know, if you want to be excluded, um, you can, you know, stick your hand in this bowl of, of worms or, you know, something really disgusting. Um, and then people would go ahead and do this because they didn't want, of course, people to think that they were racist or Nazis or, or, or whatever. Um, so they're impression managers. Uh, this is a completely normal human thing to do. Uh, and then finally, uh, we all engage in social comparison. So we understand ourselves partly uh, in terms of how we compare to others. Uh, so some of us might think, you know, we are the most liberal or most conservative uh, among all our friends. So if, you know, we start getting you know, more information, it sounds like our, our friends are actually quite liberal or conservative. It's much easier for us to, to sort of subtly shift our views. Say, well, actually, yeah, I mean, I, I'm on board with that. I would even go a little further than, you know, my friend. Uh, um, that, then it is for us to give up and, and say, oh, well, actually, I guess I'm not... I'm not really that morally pure after all. I'm, I'm not really that extreme uh, about my, my political views. So because of all this, I think it should be really unsurprising uh, that, that people engage in moral grandstanding. Now, uh, as to trends, I do think, as, as I said, that people probably are seeing more of this uh, than they did in the past. They're probably more tempted to do it themselves uh, than in the past. And that's, that's because, as you might guess, of, of social media. So we're all... Uh, exposed all the time. Uh, to, we're recording this on election day. This is at, at fever pit here in America. <laughs> it's election day. This is all at fever pitch. Um, so it's almost impossible to avoid seeing other people engage in, in grandstanding. And you know, by extension, it's very easy uh, for all of us to engage in grandstanding. I, I'm sure you must be very tempted to, to do this all the time, Ricardo, with your your big audience. Show them how, how good you are, uh, because it's now almost costless to do it. You just put up, you know, move your thumbs around a little bit, put up a post. You've got hundreds or thousands of people, t you know, telling you how great you are, um, liking what you said, retweeting it, sharing it, whatever. Um, so you know, the the whole machine of of social media is based on grandstanding. Uh, and of course, you know, now there's work by, by psychologists showing if you want to go viral, a sure way to do, to do this is to include moral emotional words in, in your post. So this is what people do because uh, they figure out very quickly this is an effective strategy for self-promotion. Mm -hmm. So would you say that when we use moral talk, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we have to do it to show our values to other people and to, to signal that we are part of their group, their moral tribe or something like that. But there are instances, and that's where moral grandstanding enters the picture, where we use moral talk irresponsibly.
Right. That's right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what you say is exactly right. So our, our book is called The Use and Abuse of Moral Talk. Uh, and, you know, so I think a lot of people come to this topic thinking, you know, all talk about morality is, is just garbage. Um, we shouldn't do it. It's, it's annoying. It's frustrating and so on. We think that's wrong. It's really important for pe- people to be able to talk about moral issues and, and their moral views and even to show other people where they stand. But you can do all of those things without engaging in grandstanding. So this is why I said it's so important for people uh, to understand um, that showing, you know, just expressing moral views is fine. Uh, and this is, you know, one of the reasons that virtue signaling is, is such a dumb term uh, because you get people then arguing, you know, saying, well, actually, this behavior is all good. Uh, and then they come up with, you know, the, the easy examples of just like talking about about moral issues. And of course, it, it's fine. It's, it's good uh, that, that they do that. But, you know, what they don't then, you know, faces the actual hard question, uh, which is whether you have to do this in order to seek status uh, for uh to you know, achieve all of the the noble ends that they point. And the answer is, of course, you don't. Um, so this is, you know, when people start uh, engaging in, in this talk for self promotion, uh, to increase their status, to dominate others, uh, which is just another form of of gaining status. That's when there's a problem, and that's when it's grandstanding. Mm-hmm. So that's one part of the question, but the other isn't it the case that. For example, when people are discussing a subject and they turn it into a moral question, then things get a little bit more aggressive, for example. I mean, when we're talking about things related to our morality, it's usually some of the circumstances where we become more attached to our ideas and more violent and we tend to think that if other people think differently they must be wrong and sometimes we dehumanize them a little bit right yeah um yeah so so i guess some you know some philosophers would be very angry if i say this but not all issues are moral issues uh, or at least there, you know, there are some some questions where you can introduce moral considerations, and it's not appropriate. It's it's not actually important. Uh, it obscures other other things that are at stake, and it prevents people from, you know, as you note, having a reasonable discussion about about whatever the issue is. Um, now, if you know people can gain status by grandstanding, then all of these issues are, are uh, under threat of, of moral encroachment, right? So you'll have people want, you know, looking for an opportunity uh, to, to gain some status, and, and they'll say, well, here's you know, a, a spot where, where people are talking about this thing, and they're not talking about justice. Well, I can fix that, and I can, I can get something for myself from it uh, in, in the meantime, right? So um, you know, as, as you know, you, we can um, end up turning uh, issues into moral ones. Uh, and this is not always a, a productive way to go. Um, so, so in particular, um, you know, you can end up giving short shrift to other considerations, um, considerations of prudence or efficiency or, or something like that, because people just want to talk about justice. Uh, and so, you know, once once that starts happening, uh, it becomes harder to talk about, you know, the economy or, or, or whatever. Uh, these people say, well, I mean, you're going to let money get in the way of the right thing to do. It's like, well, I mean, these things are, are not necessarily unrelated. Uh, but but anyhow, um, yeah. So so this is another way uh, in which grandstanding sets up bad incentives uh, to have have conversations go poorly. Mm-hmm. So. Moral grandstanders present themselves as better than other people from a moral standpoint, but do we know if they really believe what they say? That uh, do we know if they really think they are better than others from a moral perspective? Mm. I mean, I, I don't. Uh, I guess I don't know that there's a good test for this uh, that we can apply from a third-person perspective. Um, you know, so so I'm not. You know, I don't think. I mean, so we have like a field guide in the book that you know that we can talk about uh, about the things that people tend to do when they're grandstanding. But nowhere in the book do we say here's how to spot a grandstander for sure. 
here's how to know if, if they're insincere. Here's how to know if they really think they're better than, than everyone else. Now, you know, you can look at their behavior and say, well, you know, look, look at how this discussion is going. One person, you know, makes a claim and this person said, you know, this person that I think is probably grandstanding um, comes back and says, yes, that. But I mean, why wouldn't you go a little further like me? Uh, and they do this over and over and over again. Um, then, you know, that, that to me suggests this person is, is probably just trying to, to sort of gain status within the sin group and, and look like, you know, the vanguard, uh, the, the really morally enlightened uh, person. Um, so, again, you know, no, no foolproof test for this. But uh, um, this is the kind of thing that makes me think like, yeah, someone, this person is a grandstander. Mm -hmm. And what about, uh, I mean, do we know if people are aware that they are using this tactic? Mm. I mean, that they are using moral grandstanding to their favor? Yeah, I think they very often aren't. Uh, again, it's it's hard to tell. I don't, yeah. you know, I, I don't know what is in someone's heart. Uh, I, I don't know for sure, like what exactly someone's motives are when, when they engage in, in moral talk. Um, and there's reason to think that uh, like many things that are, are part of our uh, cognitive architecture, uh, it's just hidden from us. So, you know, there's we are massively self-deceived beings. Uh, so it's, it's a lot easier for, you know, for us to, to go about in, in the world um, not being aware of everything that's motivating us all the time. Um, so there's, I think, good reason to think that grandstanding is, is like this. We don't always know, like, we're, uh, we're doing the things that we're doing because we want other people to like us or that we're, we're looking for status or respect or sex or, or whatever um, because you know if we were aware of the, these things like sometimes we would be repulsed to, at ourselves right or, or maybe we would find it harder to do these things so you know we instead uh, have other motives uh, either that we invent socially that are kind of polite fictions about why people do the things they're doing or um, that are, are just kind of um, things that make it easier for us to look at ourselves in, in the mirror um, so you know again grandstanding you know, is is just one one phenomenon like anything else people do socially. Uh, so it, I think uh, there's every reason to think it works in the same way. Yeah, uh, and does grandstanding really work? I mean, perhaps we mm -hmm. would have to talk about the goals that a grandstander has when he uses that tactic. But I mean, could it be that it works with some people and not with <laughs> others? How, how does it work exactly? <laughs> Yeah, so few, so some people have a gag reflex about it, and other others don't. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I, I think you know, uh, like detecting liars, right? So some people are, are better than others at, at seeing whether whether someone's lying. Uh, of course, it's probably the very same for for uh, being suspicious of, about whether someone is engaged in grandstanding. Um, now, does it work? There are like some things that that make it uh, more likely to work. Right, so uh, the person uh, you know, in, engaging in the grandstanding, um, it's more likely to, to work on an audience that agrees with them about, about their politics. Um, uh, it's also more likely to work if you know, the thing that they're saying is, is kind of in keeping with what we'd expect them to say. So when, uh, you know, when Harvey Weinstein, you know, after it, it becomes you know, uh, pretty clear that, that he, uh, engaged in, in lots of sexual abuse and even sexual assault uh, involving women, uh, it became a good bit less credible that he actually respected women. Uh, and, you know, he releases this, this statement. So, I mean, we say in the book, this is, is pretty obviously uh, grandstanding, uh, but it probably didn't work very well because uh, even though he's aiming it at, at his political and, and social in-group and talking about how much he hates the, the National Rifle Association and Donald Trump, um, you know, none of these people are going to believe him anymore because uh, they, they think this guy is um, is just he's a liar. Like we know what he's doing, but behind closed doors, we have all these women coming forward, you know, bravely to to tell their tale. Um, so uh, yeah, so grandstanding is not necessarily going to work. Uh, it also uh, is less likely to work if uh, if you do it kind of clumsily. Uh, so if you just come out and say, well, as you know, the most morally impressive person in the room, 
right? No one is, is going to think better of you because of that. You have to, to sort of play, you know, play a game a little bit and do a bit of indirect speech um, and kind of just imply that, you know, that you're better. Like by showing people that you can recognize an important moral phenomenon or make an important moral distinction uh, or that, you know, you see a problem here where, where other people don't. Um, these are things that, that might be a, a more uh, socially uh, – acceptable uh, form of proof that you're a, a morally good person and that they're more likely to work as forms of grandstanding. Mm -hmm. And is it more common in some groups than others? I mean, I'm not sure if, you, if we should get right away into politics, <laughs> but maybe to talk about the left, right mm. wing divide. I mean, could it be that there are a political, there is a political poll that usually is is composed more of people that are moral grandstanders <laughs> now i mean there could be in principle um but our evidence suggests that there's not um so i mean as i said um people are whether they're on the right or left are not more likely to grandstand just in virtue of, of being on, on the right or, or left um you know, what the data does suggest, again, is, is that if you have more extreme moral views, uh, you're more likely to, to engage in grandstanding. I think the reason for that uh, is not, you know, not only um, would, would we expect people who are uh, in, in kind of smaller, uh, more uh, insular and like isolated uh, groups with like strong views, um, you know, I think we should expect those people uh, to to care a lot more about like their small like vanguard uh, group of friends or, or whatever and, and try to keep up with them uh, Whereas, you know people who are just kind of in the middle uh, Have no no very strong feelings about politics their social circles aren't really dominated by people who are You know choosing their friends on the basis of their political views um, so, so that part should be un, you know unsurprising um, I think also just in general um, you know, to draw this point out a little more, people um, uh, whose networks are based on values, um, I, I think it's it's just inevitable uh, that that those groups uh, will be more likely to grandstand. So you know, it's not just politics. You know, you can take some religious groups. So you know, if if a religious group uh, is is not just a, a sort of like, you know. Um, so I, I don't mean to like make it sound not serious, but you know, if if, if religious groups are sort of like, yeah, you know, we go to church, we, we believe in God, and and you know, uh, but we don't really care that much about doctrine. It's just about you know, um, liking each other and and caring about about you know hardships and so on. Those people are probably less likely to grandstand than than a church that's like, no, we need to all get on the same page about all of this stuff. Um, you know, uh, really, you know bother each other about how we're living and, and so on, you know, you can see, of course, pe people who are living that way are, are going to, to be more likely uh, to grandstand to, to make other people think that, that they're, you know, that they're really, you know, really good people, right? Because they don't want to be bothered, right? They, they want uh, their, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the building blocks of respect uh, in, in their community to be really firmly established uh, in, in their own case. Yeah. So there are different ways people grandstand. And in the book, you talk about five different common ones, like piling up, ramping up, ramping up displays of strong emotions and dismissiveness. Could you tell us about each of them? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think this is the most fun part of the book. This is this is the stuff that people really have fun with. And it like it helps them understand uh, a lot of stuff that they see that, that they find really uh, obnoxious on, on social media, especially. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. So one of the things that people do is they engage in piling on. Uh, so you see, you know, on Twitter, so, someone has, has done something wrong uh, today. Uh, and a lot of people are, are giving them grief for it. You know, they're, they're getting ratioed, right? Um, they're getting thousands of replies, very few likes and so on. It's the same insults over and over and over again. Uh, but, you know, everybody's got to get their two cents in uh, about how awful this person is, how, you know, no decent human being would behave as they did. So it's a pile on. Uh, so the reason that pe people do this, um, I mean, some of them just really like kicking someone when they're down. Uh, but, you know, a good reason to do this is if you uh, want some status, 
uh, is that it shows other people in your group that you're not shy about your values. You're, you're kind of courageous even. Uh, you're willing to fight for, for what's right. Um, and, uh, you know, e even if it's just to say, yeah, every, you know, everybody else is, is, is right here, you're a jerk, or, you know, if, to repeat the same thing that's been said, you know, thousands of times, it, you know, at least, you know, some of your friends will see, uh, okay, he, he got in on this too, right? <laughs> so it's uh, at least some signal that, that you, uh, you have the right values, right? You don't, you're not a, you're not a coward. Um, ramping up. Uh, so sometimes uh, moral discussion will turn into a kind of moral arms race where the goal is, is not to say something true. Uh, it's to arrive at like the maximally, you know, morally pure uh, but socially acceptable position. Uh, so, you know, someone will say, uh, you know, uh, this this trade deal is, is not great. You know, it's uh, I, th I think it calls for sacrifices from the working class that uh, that, you know, are just going to make things harder for those folks. You know, and then someone replies, not great. This is fucking bullshit. Like, <laughs> you know, how could anyone do this? You know, and so and you know, so then, you know, we're off to the races and, and uh, it's just a, a sort of uh, a fight to see who can adopt the, the most extreme position that people are, are going to uh, give them any credit for. Uh, right. So as, as Louis C.K. Once, once said, that, you know, the meal doesn't stop when I'm full. It stops when I hate myself. Right. So grandstanding, when it becomes a, a, a kind of moral arms race like this, uh, it doesn't stop when you arrive at the truth. Uh, it stops when you no longer are, are going to win like social approval for taking a more extreme stance. So, you know, there's not necessarily anything wrong, of course, with taking a more extreme position, but it, you know, the process should be truth sensitive and ramping up is not. Uh, okay. Trumping up. Uh, so people engage in, in trumping up when they kind of invent spurious moral charges, uh, to, to level at other people. So it might be, you know, the, the evidence that someone has actually done the thing that you're accusing them of is kind of flimsy, uh, or uh, it, it could be just a, a very exotic moral charge. Like, I, I think cultural appropriation is now passe, but it, uh, so, and, and for that reason, people are bothering with it less. Uh, but a few years ago, this was like a very new thing, uh, and so you could show that you were with it. Um, uh, you know, by, by educating, you know, people about this, this horrible wrong of cultural appropriation. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, Trump, Trump, have what, uh, I, I think it's reasonable to say is, is a bullshit moral charge, um, to, uh, uh, you know, impress people with, with how, how advanced you are morally. Um, so, you know, if it's not cultural appropriation, it'll be something else. And, you know, uh, digital blackface or, or whatever else, um, you know, it's, a, it's uh, impossible to keep up with, with the examples. Um, uh, displays of strong emotion. Uh, so one way of showing people that you feel strongly about something that you have really uh, firm moral convictions is to get really upset when someone uh, violates your moral expectations. Uh, so this is why we see so many people outraged every single day. And by that I mean like one person, every day that person is outraged about something new, some minor you know, thing that's gonna get a two minute news, you know, two minutes of coverage on, on a 24 hour news network, that person is outraged about it, right? Um, so you know, it doesn't have to be outraged, they can also just be very upset. You know, I'm just, I, I'm, I cried myself to sleep last night thinking about this election result. Uh, can't get over it, uh, you know, looking for sturdy beams in the garage uh, to, to end it all, right? Uh, so, you, you know, um, I mean, we can talk about whether whether this is morally a good thing. I think it's pretty obviously not um, that uh, that people are, are always running to uh, to show that, you know, they have the strongest possible emotional reaction to whatever has happened. Uh, and then finally, uh, grandstanders are, are often really dismissive of people they disagree with. So, you know, they'll say things like, I mean, if you don't see the problem here, I don't even know what to tell you. Uh, I mean, you are so in the dark. Um, you know, someone like me, I, I haven't thought about, I haven't even thought about how to explain this to someone so stupid uh, and so morally corrupt and so long. I wouldn't even know what to say, right? Uh, so, the, you know, the thought here is like, I can't, I can't even get my hands dirty dealing with you. But if I did, you know, it would be one for the ages, right? Uh, so, you know, 
This is not great, of course, uh, because you know, we want people to actually have productive moral arguments. Uh, but you know, if if there's status to be gained by by you know ruling out positions out of hand, you know, it's like beneath us even to discuss this. Uh, then, of course, grandstanders are going to do this and they're going to ab abuse this move. Which I mean, sometimes it's fine, uh, but you know, it shouldn't be your your go-to move to say like I you know I can't even talk to you, right? Okay. Anyway, so that's that's the field guide. The, again, the thought is not that every single time someone does something that roughly fits this this description or any of these descriptions, they must be grandstanding. Uh, but you know, when people are grandstanding, these are the kinds of things they tend to do. So uh, anyway, there you go. Yeah, but you also talk in the book about social costs. So what are the social costs of grandstanding? Yeah, uh, so we talk about a few of them. Uh, one is that grandstanding causes political polarization. So it, it causes people to adopt more extreme views uh, over time, uh, and it causes them to have more strongly negative uh, uh, em emotions uh, or, or you know, affect about people in the outgroup. So the reason it does this uh, is because it, you know, it, uh, among grandstanders, moral talk often turns turns into this ramping up arms race. Um, so, you know, this is a, a place where I think it really matters to, to understand that um, grandstanders are really often sincere. They mean the things that they're saying, um, and that's that sucks actually because um, you know when when they're grandstanding, they're taking these really extreme views, and I think they really believe it. Um, so because they're kind of comparing themselves to their friends and try, trying to one up them and show that they're they're the purest morally, uh, people move in more extreme directions. They they adopt for bad reasons really strong moral views, uh, and you know you have this play out in, in these uh, you know really politically active friend groups and and political networks over time, and you know what you get is uh, a vanguard of of crazy people. Who are completely disconnected from what the, the rest of the world thinks about what, what we ought to do. Uh, so, in other words, you get polarized groups. Um, so, you know, this is not necessarily bad, right, in some way, right? So maybe some of this polarization dr moves these people closer to the truth. But again, because it's not truth sensitive, uh, they're not going to stop there. They're going to keep going. Right. Uh, and not only that, like even if you think your side is, is getting you know, closer to the truth by, by moving more and more left or more and more right, the other side is doing the same thing. Uh, and you all have to live together, like it or not. Uh, so this, this is not a good result. Uh, cynicism. So grandstanding, I, I think when, when people find out that, that other people uh, or when it becomes clear that other people are, are engaging in moral talk for self-promotion, they become cynical about the whole enterprise of engaging in moral discussion. So they'll think, why would I even talk to this person? They're not even trying to get it right. They're just trying to impress people, right? You know, I don't, I don't want to, to talk to people who are, like, won't have an honest conversation with me, like based on, on the evidence and, and good arguments. I don't want to talk to someone who's just trying to impress people. Um, so they'll think like, if this is all it is to talk about morality with people, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to pay any attention, uh, when, when they talk about, you know, the latest thing that's so horribly unjust, right? They'll, um, so it's, there's a kind of boy who cried wolf phenomenon here. Um, so someone says every single day, um, you know, something terrible has happened. You know, this is the greatest injustice of, of our time. I mean, you, you listen to them like once or twice and then it's, it's like, who cares anymore? This person is is, is not a reliable uh, a reliable signal. Uh, you know, so this this ties into the the third sort of cost, which is outrage exhaustion. Um, so you know, this has two sides. So on, on the one hand, you'll no longer take other people's outrage as uh, any kind of like meaningful signal that you should do something or or uh, you know look into a matter uh, because you you just think well that person's just always mad they're all, they're always upset like who cares uh, whereas you know if you see someone who's normally like very calm and and uh, um, you know not really politically active then they start saying like whoa you know so or you know if the, you know they're they're not uh, not usually that interested in whatever morally is going on in the world. Uh, if they start speaking up and you think, okay, well maybe there's, you know, there's something wrong here. So like, um, 
this is not really a moral example, but like when the NBA canceled the season, um, I started thinking, oh my God, okay, the coronavirus is actually really serious, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but when it's just like a bunch of people who like want something to be wrong because Donald Trump is president, I, I'm like, well, I, I, don't, I don't really know if this is a, a real problem. Um, anyway, uh, the other side of outrage exhaustion uh, is that if you are, are like always just angry uh, about whatever, you know, whatever state you think the world is in, it's not going to motivate you to do anything, right? And you're going to stop being able to get angry uh, because you're just worn out, right? So um, you become habituated, as psychologists would say, uh, into being angry. Uh, and so it's just like meaningless, uh, uh, even to you to, to think like, well, should I? I mean, okay, well, I mean, I'm angry about this. This is really bad. Oh, but I was angry yesterday. I was angry last week. Angry, you know, every single day for the past like six years. Like, you know, so what now? Um, right. So this is really bad uh, because our moral emotions, like outrage, uh, um, like resentment, like like whatever else, um, these are supposed to be things that motivate us to act. Uh, but if we're abusing them and and always, you know, uh, trying to show other people how outraged we are, then they stop doing their job. Right. These emotions stop working for us. Uh, so all, you know, all of these things are, are really bad uh, social consequences of, of grandstanding. Now, you know, there might be, um, you know, there might be good effects of grandstanding, too. Um, and one of those things is you might get uh, information spread quickly, you know, because there's something in it for people to um, uh, <clears throat> to, to spread the news and you know, show that, that it's a moral problem or something like that. But as I said, you can do that without grandstanding. Right. And people do, in fact, do those things without grandstanding. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, I'm open to there being a good consequentialist case to grandstand. Uh, but I, I guess I haven't seen anything so far that makes me think like it's necessary that people are, are actually getting something out of this, like status wise. You know, otherwise they're not going to do the right thing or something like that. Uh, I would need to see that the, that the grandstand is actually necessary uh, in, in order uh, for it to be something morally defensible. Yeah. So since we're talking about morality here, uh, another thing that people care about in other people is if they <coughs> are virtuous people or not. So, I mean, <coughs> are there any instances where moral grandstanding can be a virtuous <coughs> attitude to have? So I, I, I'm less, I guess, less sympathetic about thinking... No, I mean, maybe I've forgotten something in the book, but <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm less sympathetic uh, to thinking that, that grandstanding could ever in itself be, be virtuous. Uh, the reason I think that <clears throat> is that uh, I think morality is generally a, about helping other people, ab about doing something, um, especially moral talk. Uh, I mean, I think it should be mostly ab about, um, I mean, now, well, okay, hold on, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Mostly, when you engage in moral talk, you should be standing up for other people. You should be saying, like, you know, this this person like deserves our respect. Um, there, there's something wrong about the way they're being treated. Um, we should do something about it. Uh, or there's this big moral problem that affects a lot of people. Um, you know, we should do something about it. Now, you know, as I was interrupting myself, there is moral value in like sticking up for yourself um, and and that sort of thing. Like self-respect is also a moral value. What is not really a, a, an important moral value, though, is people thinking well of you for having the right moral views. Um, so I guess I, I just I have a hard time seeing that as something that a virtuous person is going to be that concerned about. Now, I know there there are virtue ethicists to, like Aristotle, apparently uh, people keep telling me um, uh, thought, you know, you know, the, the virtuous person will care a great deal about about their their they'll be proud of their reputation. They'll expect, you know, recognition uh, for. Uh, <clears throat> for ha you know, for being virtuous, for having the right views, and, and so on. I guess I just think this is kind of pathetic. Um, I, I think it's sort of lame to to be that concerned uh, about about whether people recognize that that you have the good moral views. Um, now, you know, it might be that it's just kind of unavoidable uh, that that people will will want. Um, Will want fame or, or want the esteem of, of others for for this reason. And I, I mean, I think it's fine to want the esteem of others. I guess I just think it's it's lame to want it uh, because of your moral views. Um, so, 
I, I guess this is this is just a part uh, a part of the book where I, I'm happy to to disagree with with Aristotle and, and think like it's just not that kind. Of, that's not what morality is for. It's not what moral talk is for. It's it's not for getting other people to like you. Um, and if that's what you think it's for, there's something wrong. Um, you, you shouldn't use it that way. Yeah. Well, I guess that many people think moral philosophers think that virtue ethicists are even more boring than Kant. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess, I guess to be honest, I am, I am, I often feel a lot of sympathy with, with that camp. Um, yeah, yeah. but I mean, it, it, I think for, for this issue, it, it is worth thinking about, uh, sort of, um, uh, about virtue and, and, and what it should say about grandstanding. So, yeah, sure. So <laughs> let's talk now specifically about political grandstanding, but to do the transition between moral grandstanding and political grandstanding, what is the relationship between morality and politics? Oof, yeah. So could you say a little bit more about, about what you mean? But, but I mean, so I could give you like any of five answers and, and most of them I think would be not what you're looking for. Um, so, so what do you mean? Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess that what I was trying to ask is if morality is behind politics or influences politics in some important way. Mm. Uh, so do you mean, uh, sorry, like political practice or if it should influence our institutions or something like that? Or... Uh, I mean, but basically, if the reason why people choose one side or the other of the political aisle is due to their moral values something okay. like that yeah uh i so i think often that's probably the case um so you know some someone might think that you know this or that party or candidate um seems more likely to have my to you know share my particular values but i think there are there are also people uh who choose a, a side you know thinking like, well, I think they actually are more or less on the same page about most values, or at least the ones I care about. And they, you know, one side just um, <clears throat> has the, the practical part of, of the answer uh, to what we should do down better than the other, right? So may, maybe, you know, one, uh, maybe you think like markets uh, don't really work. Um, and, and so you think like, well, look, if, if, uh, if the American, you know, Republican Party were correct about <laughs> What markets would do if we just had like unfettered free markets, then um, it would be fine. But you know they're they're completely wrong about that, uh, and so I can't support that party or something like that. I think that's not a moral case for for choosing a party, um, but uh, but often, I mean, as you say, people probably do choose uh, uh, their candidates or, or the parties they they support uh, on the basis of of what values um, those parties express or or in fact have. Um, so, I mean, I think you're going to ask me now about, about, uh, whether political grandstanding is, is good. Right. Um, so, yeah. so, so l let me, let me just roll that into this one. Um, so I think, um, it can be good, right? So, so it is actually, uh, I mean, you know, Brandon and I say in the book, we actually think politicians are. Uh, have a little bit more leeway than than normal people uh, about grandstanding because it does actually tell voters something about them uh, when they they say something just to let people know where their heart lies. Right? It's not so important for you or me, Ricardo, to, to go on on Twitter and, and let everybody know how much we hate or love Donald Trump, right? But you know, for for a politician to do that, like. That is important information, maybe for for some voters to to get, you know, uh, to get a, a a picture of uh, of what their uh, what their values are. Now, you know, the pro immediately a, a problem is that it might not be good information, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the politician might just be taking whatever uh, stance they they think is going to be politically expedient this week. Right. And then that doesn't tell the voter anything about about what they're likely to, to do or what policies they're likely to support in the future. Um, but, you know, if if the politician is actually showing people what they're likely to do, I think that's valuable in, in a democracy. Yeah. 
So, I, I mean, the people that are mo more politically active, like political activists, for example, I guess that those would be the ones that would resort to political grandstanding more often. I mean, in that case, could we say that activists, in a way, due to their political grandstanding, could be alienating more moderate people that most of the time or many times are not that politically active from political discourse or even from politics itself. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really important worry. Um, <clears throat> now, I, so I think some activists, right, still have a little bit more leeway because, you know, they have to um, you know, they have to uh, impress donors, right? And make make people think like if they donate to this organization, it'll be money well spent. Like these people really are trying to solve this problem or, or something like that. Uh, but I think this uh, more than in the case of politicians needs to be balanced uh, against this worry that we're driving moderates from the public square, right? So people see political discourse and they see, you know, people immediate, you know, they say, uh, you know something about what they believe and immediately the other side is at their throats thinking, well, I bet you think this too and and you know it gets you know right away really extreme really nasty a person who's just kind of on the fence or has a nuanced view they'll see a discussion like this and think there's nothing here for me right why would I talk to these people about, about you know my nuanced position about abortion or, or whatever when I know you know right away both sides are going to pounce on me and call me like the worst kind of human being and, and just, you know, try like dox me and try to get me fired from my job and, and whatever else. Why would you participate in discussions when that's how they're going? Right. So, um, I mean, I guess politicians also have, have to worry about about this. Um, but I mean, I think this this is just exactly the kind of thing uh, that shows that our public discourse is, is really unhealthy. Uh, because we, even if you think, you know, people in the middle are, are kind of confused, um, they just haven't figured, uh, politics out, you know, that, um, it's not our job. They, to they can't be them, trusted. Ever. <laughs> yeah, right. They can't be trusted. Or one not, camp or the other. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even if you think that it's important that you have people, uh, throwing in like new perspectives that you don't hear, uh, because you're just like always talking to your extremist friends or you only see like the most extreme representations of views on the other side. Like we need moderates uh, to, to throw the brakes on and make people explain these extreme views uh, and, and maybe get people to, to back down from some of the crazier things that, that they think. Uh, but if, you know, if we make it socially so costly uh, for moderates to, to engage in political discussions, we'll lose that. And we in fact have lost that, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I, mean, I hear from people all the time who just say like, I just, you know, I, I don't even, the only reason I go on Facebook is to wish people a happy birthday or like, you know, I, I just, I mute everybody who talks about politics. Um, so all, all of you idiots who like can't shut up about politics, this is, this is what you're getting. You're, you're going to have a network of like 10 people and the, the rest of the world is going to have unfollowed you or ignored you because they can't take it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and that's interesting because they would want to have the opposite effect. They would want for people to be more politically engaged and worried about the kinds of problems, political problems that they value. Yeah, uh, well, you'd hope so. Uh, it, if they don't care about that, then, then they might be even uh, even more uh, more extreme grandstanders than than we would want to think about, right? So they would think then, no, it really, it really is all about you know me getting social credit for for my views. Yeah. Yeah. So, since we are talking about those more extreme people, I mean, are people in general more confident about their moral and political views or positions than they should be? Do we know anything about that? I mean, is there overconfidence applied to morality and politics? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I think there very likely is, especially when there's any kind of empirical component. Um, but I mean, so he, here's a social science finding um, that that applies more or less. So, so if if you ask people um, to draw uh, how a bike works, like just the pedals and the chain and, and you know uh, the wheels and everything, 
um, you get these insane drawings, you know, things that absolutely would not work, right? Uh, and this holds even even for people who ride bicycles uh, or like who are serious cyclists. They often, you know, will draw the bike, and it's just like the chain is around all the, all the wheels, and like you know, it, I mean, it just it makes no sense, right? Uh, so once people do this exercise, like they become less confident that they know how a bike works. And, and so, you know, it's not just bikes, of course, the point is that this is just like in general, people, um, go through life thinking that they understand more things than they, than they actually do. Right. And then when, when you ask them to actually explain those things, uh, they, they might become less confident, but until then they're, they're overconfident. They know how a bike works. They know how the economy works. Um, you know, they, they know everything about abortion that they need to know, um, or, or whatever else. Um, so th you know, this is one reason that political discussion is so important uh, because people need, <laughs> need to have these like daily reminders like, Oh yeah, actually, you know, once you get away from the talking points that, that I'm familiar with about this issue, I, I guess I don't really know what to think or, or like, you know, if, if they're honest at all, they'll see like, you know, you try to extend out any, someone's position on abortion at all to like other, other issues of, of harm or, or defense of harm or, or whatever. It's like, oh, uh, this is pretty complicated. <laughs> uh, right. So, so I, I think, yes, um, you, you know, your, your, the point your question is getting is, is absolutely, people are, are absolutely overconfident about, uh, about everything probably, but, but certainly morality and politics and, and especially when, uh, there's any kind of empirical or, or complicated systematic component, uh, to, to their views. Yeah. And I guess that it's always, it's also suspicious to think that, uh, I mean, one side of the aisle would be always always correct, right, Com uh, always right about issue. all yeah. subjects, and the <laughs> other always yeah. wrong. I mean, then there are people that really do believe that. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's so crazy. They, they you know, the right just happens to be right about about immigration, uh, about taxes. Uh, about gun control. I mean, none of these issues have anything to do with each other, apparently, I think. Uh, but, you know, this one group just, I mean, they just got the best people, you know? Um, yeah, it's ridiculous. Of, co of course it's ridiculous. So, yeah, so whenever I, you know, whenever you meet someone who just, ha you know, thinks, yeah, the, the right is just right about everything, or the left is just right ab about everything, um, I just, you know, you think this is not a serious person. You know, this, this, is, this is a team player. Right, you're getting the the official party line from them, uh, and and no deep thought about anything. Yeah. Okay. So just before we finish, let's talk about the solutions for moral grandstanding. We've already talked about the benefits a little bit. We talked about the negative effects of it. So, so how should we? deal with this problem of moral grandstanding yeah uh so so you folks at home here's what you're going to want to do you're going to want to look at that field guide look at our account of grandstanding and say i know like i've got the goods now i can bring the receipts and show that you know this person i can't stand on twitter or whatever you're grandstanding this is what you're doing don't do that okay <laughs> don't call people out uh, i know it's tempting I, I know it'll feel great uh but here's what will happen um, you'll get some confused, like garbled talk about virtue signaling and how it's good back or you'll say, Oh no, actually they'll say, no, I'm actually like quite sincere or they'll accuse you of grandstanding. So you're grandstanding by accusing me of grandstanding. Uh, and all of these are just like really unproductive, uh, uh, forms of discussion. Uh, also of note, if you, you know, come at, come at a grandstander, but you know, with an accusation of grandstanding, you're then going to start a a discussion about whether they're in fact a good person and that is exactly what they want so don't give them what they want don't make public moral talk about whether they're a good person that's not an important issue so here's what you should do instead uh, you should ignore those people don't give them any likes don't engage with them if they're a good friend and like you want to talk to them about about I mean I still wouldn't talk to them about their own behavior but if you want to talk to them about like grandstanding in general maybe that's okay in in private uh, but you know these these public blowups are just not doing anybody any good um, but you know the hope is if enough people start ignoring other people's grandstanding they'll stop doing it right because 
they won't be getting what they were after. They, so, you know, imagine sitting down and spending like half an hour writing, you know, a, like a 2000 word like rant about how bad Donald Trump is and nobody even likes nobody. You don't get a single like right? you, you feel like an idiot, right? Or you got like three likes. You still feel like an idiot. So, you know, if enough people heed this advice, uh, grandstanding will uh, will die down a bit. Uh, and, and it might, you know, even on its own, people, people might just get sick of it. And, you know, the reason it'll die out uh, is because enough people will stop getting credit for doing it. Um, the other thing that you should do is take this as an opportunity to work on yourself. So you know how, how bad grandstanding is now. You, you listen presumably to this whole talk. Maybe you, you'll even read the book uh, and you'll know this is a really important social problem. We've got to stop doing it. Uh, and I don't want to be a part of the problem. So ask yourself when you're about to contribute to, to some discussion in, in public moral discourse, if nobody were impressed, nobody thought any better of me uh, because of what I'm about to say, would I be okay with that or would I be disappointed? And if you would be disappointed, that's pretty good evidence that you're about to engage in grandstanding and maybe you should just sit this one out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other suggestions or... By the, yeah, buy the book, uh, give, give, it as a, give it as a gift to the grandstanders in, in your life. Um, tell, tell people you heard this, this fun interview with this, this great interviewer, Ricardo, and this, this Tosi guy, uh, and, and spread the word. Yeah, great. Okay, so guys, again, the book is Grandstanding, the Use and Abuse of Moral Talk. Run and buy it. It's a very interesting book and a great read. And thank you for writing it, Dr. Tozi. And as I said at the beginning, it was a real pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for all your questions. I, I really enjoyed this. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladeza Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.